Hello and welcome to watch the Knitting with Nala podcast. This is episode 58. Today is Friday 2nd of July 2021. My name is Nella and I'm coming to you from Eastern Finland, Johan so to be exact. And we have a heat wave. It's been going on for about three weeks now, give or take. And uh, I would not mind if it were a bit cooler. <laughs> I've also been uh, in uh, quarantine for uh, about a week and a half. Um, I'm fine so far. I don't know if it's the vaccination or if I just touched the bullet. We'll see. Um, but I, I'm hoping to go back to work on. Uh, beginning of next week. Um, it's been almost three months since the previous episode and I actually had to watch the episode to see what I had actually told and showed last time. Uh, I have some finished objects, I have some whips and um, actually I have purchased ton of books but I'm assuming I'm not actually going to be talking per se about the books because this is going to be a long episode without them anyway. Uh, I'll start by what I'm wearing. This is uh, one school project I uh, did so this uh, this year, or this academic year. Um, I finished it on... Where is it? On my... 10th of May and uh, it's a pattern from Unelma uh, I bought three of her patterns from uh, Helsinki craft fair last year um, that that was actually one of the last big yarn events that took place in Finland before the pandemic started and um, I can't actually remember the name of the pattern. Um, just a second, I'll go and get the pattern. So the pattern is called Emma. And uh, it has options of uh, various long sleeved and short sleeved uh, sweaters. I think I made a teeny tiny mistake between the matching or in the matching of the pattern and the fabric that I'm using. Uh, this pattern obviously calls for a heavier jersey than what I'm using. So this has this odd fit that um, it's that too loose but it's not actually loose because the fabric is so it's a knitted jersey fabric, so it's really drawing, joined together. Um, so it's, um, yeah, the pattern and the fabric that I use do not match. This pattern, uh, this pattern would have required a heavier fabric. I have heavier jersey that I have bought in meaning to make this particular sweater. And I actually think I might do that as well come uh, autumn. So um, I really like the fit. Um, I made these uh, sort of like three quarters sleeves. So uh, the pattern had an option for a full sleeve. Then it had like these short, short sleeve options. So I actually sort of like made the length according to my own. Uh, this uh, fabric is, um, I can't remember the brand, but I couldn't actually find any information of the brand, so I don't know if it's meaning meaningful anyway. I bought this fabric from uh, Lappidike about two years ago when they were closing, when they had the closing sale. I also have one fabric from the same manufacturer with the uh, unicorns. And yes, that will be a sweater as well. <laughs> um, 
it's actually sort of like the problems mostly I had when I was sewing this particular sweater or long, long sleeve tee was the problem that um, I have an overlocker so just sewing the basics together it was really easy it was really quick um, I think it took about an hour and that included me fixing my overlocker but then it is like when you have to sew the uh, trimmings so my sewing machine is nowhere near actually capable of doing things things like this so um, I'm gonna wait till I buy a new sewing machine or when I go back to school and beginning of September so we'll see but yeah um, the pattern was really great um, I did wonder because I'm not size 56 uh, but basically I had to go from quite sort of like at the um, upper end of the patterns or the uh, sizes um, of course again it's because it has the fit designed to be very different to what I had thought the fit would be and of course because I'm not really experienced in patterns and sort of like matching the pattern and the uh, fabric so I think this is partially something to do with that so if I would have chosen the heavier fabric I probably could have also chosen uh, a different kind of sizing we'll see I'll uh, I'll uh, make <laughs> make the next one so I will adjust the patterns accordingly I'm really happy with it uh, this actually today's the first time I'm wearing it uh, I've had it on a few times before <laughs> just to show it off but uh, I just collected it back from the uh, evaluation like uh, two weeks ago maybe and um, well it has been so warm I have not had any desires of wearing a long sleeve sweater um, so <laughs> Yeah, and I assume I will be wearing it only just for the uh, recording of this podcast episode and then I will go back to my linen Monday dress uh, which I have been wearing all week and which you can also see what I've been eating all week because, you know, I've been dropping things <laughs> hopefully it will wash clean um, Another project that I've finished is my sewing um, sewing box uh, this is um, I don't even know where to begin to be honest with this um, this is a cardboard box which has been covered with the flat batting and then with the Marimekko fabric um, and this is my own design because we had to make something we designed on our own completely on our own and at the outside you can see that there is a um, space for uh, needles and then there is a magnet over here so about here and at the inside let's put these place to their places So at the inside you can see that there is um, pockets, pockets. Uh, there is actually three more pockets inside here as well. It's really easy to try to show this, as you can see, guess or believe. So there are more pockets in, inside there, and then there are these. Uh, hoops where you can put things like you know uh, circular needles or something uh, cords or something something of that sorts 
and um, I'm beginning to think I should have probably glued some sort of support here behind. Um, this is just uh, um, lined uh, cotton and uh, there's the cardboard behind here so I probably should have put, put in something that would have actually keep this uh, lining on its place. Um, but that's sort of like the next time when I do something something of this matter or something of this uh, thing. Uh, this was a school project. The cue was or the assignment was that you have to have a 3D filled object that you design on your own without any um, any patterns. And I took inspiration from those old hat boxes. So um, this is actually quite spacious. And um, this might still require some uh, developing and thinking, but in general, it, it came out as the way I wanted it to be. Uh, the fabrics are the same as I have on my uh, needle hoses. Um, I have a needle cozy both for my interchangeables and my TBNs, and these patterns or these fabrics match with those. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say about this. Um, the teacher gave me a grade five of this, which was real great. I did not imagine getting a five, which is uh best possible number uh, so uh, I'm really happy with that um, really surprised but really happy and then there is a clasp and then there is a handle I usually have the handle a little bit shorter while I was carrying this uh, when I came home on a Saturday evening with uh, I tried to make just one one walk through the building because uh, I'm quarantined so I'm not supposed to meet any other people luckily this building is almost empty at the moment so um, there weren't too many people to see anyway yeah I'm really happy happy with this uh, aim large parts Uh, last assignment from this particular class is the project bag and this is a sweater sweater size uh, project bag it has invisible zipper pockets here inside I'm ridiculously rid ridiculously proud of this zipper and uh, this is a fabric I bought from Kenya when I was there 2014, I want to say. And uh, these two fabrics are something I bought from, uh, from, from my old list when they had a closing it on sale. So, yeah. And there is a handle to carry it. So yeah, I'm really, really happy with this one as well. Um, so uh, I don't know if I should tell something else about it. <laughs> uh, so these were the sewing class, sewing one one course basically. Then we had the yarn class, which would have been called 102 because we had the 101 uh, during the uh, autumn season and I've shown you some pieces uh, made for that class and I spoke some project about some projects last time already uh, we had some quilting there uh, these are not ironed now this is made with the paper technique which was actually quite cool uh, then we had this um, This is an old Cardellian traditional way of uh, doing embroidery 
It's called Virvittain ompelu. So basically you pick the pattern out with the needle and then you throw, uh, draw the yarn through. This is um, another version um, in Karelian heritage, cultural heritage. It's very common to use this uh, embroidery style, but they usually actually do it while weaving. It's called thread picking. So you would actually pick the pattern and then you would weave it with the red yarn. And once you can't do it with the weaving, then you can actually use this. Uh, the result, it looks very similar to it. And it is somewhat interchangeable. Uh, the other side, looks th they look different on both sides, but um, the both sides can be the right side. Uh, yeah, this was a pattern from uh, Vapukiiski's Punapoiminta. Uh, the teacher did provide a few patterns as well. I did not like the option, so I uh, I provided my own pattern. Um, then we had the machine embroidery. So this is just a sample sewing machine has done this. Uh, it's really cool. I don't know what to do with it just yet. Something. And then there is the free machine machine embroidery. So uh, I made a house. Um, it's just plain old sheet fabric. Basically, um, I had uh, a set of old sheets, or actually one old sheet that I had used to make the uh, mock for my skirt years ago, and now I've used mostly for projects like this. And then there was this uh, mock quilting uh, as well. This was really really cool technique to use. Uh, so basically you have like uh, you have two fabrics on top of one another and then you cut them and then you basically just uh, braid them on top below, on top, below. So yeah. These are also the fabrics I bought from uh, Kenya. They are some leftovers. Uh, I bought them in idea of me starting doing some quilting, but never did that. So now I'm actually using them for that as well. <laughs> and this is just um, plenty of different... Uh, I think it has like uh, paint, uh, painting with fabric and then sewing it together to support it. This is also just a dust piece. Uh, on that class I made this one. Uh, it's a pillowcase. Um, it has a Scotland map on it. It says your next adventure starts here and Edinburgh. And uh, it's made out of old, old uh, pillowcase actually. The uh, blue fabric uh, was the pillowcase um, which I bought, or actually mom bought me uh, from IKEA in 2002. And uh, it started to have so much holes and you know it was so boring that I took it off the rotation um, about a year ago. The back side is just plain uh, fabric I bought from uh, from one of the Colorstone sales. Uh, for this class I also made this bag. This uh, is a project bag of sorts as well. Uh, it's made of uh, of the fabric I bought from uh, Kenya. And the assignment was to embroider on, machine embroider something on, or apple applique something on from a hobby so uh, of course because I was stupid I made a mold binding needle and some thread and of course because they are almost matching colors so it's really difficult to say that it's there 
And this project bag is currently housing this monster. So these are the heels. This is the uh, toe up heel. This is much shorter than the top down. Um, there is your afterthought heel. Then there is... Sorry, no, it's not afterthought heel. It's um, hourglass, so Choro heel. Then there is uh, somewhat regular heel. Uh, you first increase and then make the shoujos for the heel. Then there is the fleege. And then there is the uh, blue and purple one, which is uh, the other way around French heel. So it will look like this on the foot. And then there is this one, which is uh, sort of a German heel. Um, I found this as a sort of like I did not see a pattern. I did find a picture of toe up socks that had something heel, which had a heel like this. So it's my own variation uh, of that particular. And it has the so called German, also known as the common heel, which means that the um, a lot of stitches here have been actually kitchenered together. And then there are some different, different uh, options for how to make your leg. Nothing fancy there. And then there is the top gun, which starts from this end. I can't remember where I was last time. I can remember I spoke about this last time, but I can't remember where I was. So I have the Dutch heel. Then I have the French heel, the taffy heel, the um, the most simple heel ever. So this is, um, I think it's called General Half Buffers uh, heel in English. In Finnish it's called the Eilis, uh, Chroma Eilis heel. Then there is the uh, Shoujo heel. Then there is the Sweet Tomato heel by Kat Bodhi. May she rest in peace. Then there is uh, a heel from uh, one of the heels from Digo. Uh, then there is the ball ribbon heel with uh, I've actually made the ball the um, decreases the cosset decreases here at the bottom of the foot. Um, it looks really odd, but it actually fits surprisingly nice. Um, the ball ribbon heel is an old Irish Irish. Uh, uh, heel and I've used the kitchener stitch here I think at least some places where it was you just made the three needle point off which is not really nice then there is the thing called strong heel uh, this was something I found a pattern from uh, Google then there is the uh, tube heel for a tube sock one size fits all then there is the half handkerchief heel, uh, which is really, really sharp, triangular shaped. Then there is the German strap heel, which does not have any sort of posit for it. Then there is the sling heel. And then there is the fleece upside down or from top down. And then there is the app dot heel. I don't know what happened to it. It came really, really short. Really short. But yeah. Let's get you back in the back. Uh, I haven't figured out yet what to do with the heels, so they are completely on this back. Let me see. Oh. 
I have to redo my whips board so that I can accommodate the starting academic start starting new academic year. Uh, hats showed last time long sleeve D. Yes, that will be talking project box done, pillowcase done, heels done. Project banks are somewhere. There, they are done. Yeah. Uh, I did finish my um, drum cutter. I do not have it with me. It's at the summer cottage because I use it there mostly. I will bring it back home when I settle for the winter here. Um, I will insert a photo here. Um, I'm really happy how it turned out. Um, I still haven't actually properly done any coding with it because I thought some wool I took with me to do some coding is actually unwashed. So I have to first figure out how to wash it before I can actually, you know, start coding. So uh, that will still have to happen. Um, we also made an electric spinning uh, or e-spinner. I did mention last time that we were making it. Uh, we did we did make it, and we did finish. I did not have a chance to spin with it. Uh, mostly because it took a while to actually figure out the drive band issues. We had some drive band issues. So uh, the uh, my study partner, who, who now owns the spinner, because I already have one and they don't. So um, we did figure it out, but I haven't actually seen the spinner after that. So I haven't spun with it. My other finished objects include not many things. One, my null bound hat, which is made in Oslo stitch, which I finished yesterday, or well, technically today. Well, yesterday in a sense before I went to bed today, or yesterday. <laughs> uh, it's made of Oslo. Uh, so Oslo Stitch is a Finnish family 1 plus 1, F1. You can also make Oslo with F2. And um, then I have the last round. Ra last round here it's made in Bjerspo Stitch, which is the Oslo variant. So it's a Finnish 1 plus 1, F1 with the pleated edge. Which means that usually in Oslo Stitch you go under both your loop on the finger and your working yarn. In Bjornsbu you go under the finger loop and then you go over your working yarn. So it creates a bit different bit different uh, texture. And uh, I decided to I sort of like like the effect of it here at the uh, end. This is done in Novita Hukke wool. Um I bought this yarn um, actually in April. Yeah, since the previous episode, <laughs> which came out three months ago, I have sold my apartment uh, in southern Finland, which is uh, really great in my opinion because economical freedom. Um, uh, so um, I went there to signed the papers. I drove there. I, I drove down there on Sunday and I drove back home on Monday. And uh, on my way back on Monday, I stopped at the uh, Korea, which is where Novitas uh, fabric uh, the factories. And I bought sweaters quantity of Novitas in this almost electric blue. It's really gorgeous blue shade. And then I bought two skeins of Noida Hukke wool and I cast it on this project as soon as I got home. And it's not finished. It took just a one skein. This is the second skein, what I have left of it. I assume it's somewhere between 80 and 90 grams. The scale I use is uh, at the summer cottage at the moment, so uh, I'm not exactly sure how much I have left. 
Another project I have been working on is a pair of socks. Uh, these are also null binded. Um, if you think they look a bit different, they are because I forgot to make the first increase round here. So the increases are actually, they have the same amount of increases, they are just portioned differently. Um, these are made in uh, Rindal stitch, which is a Korean variant. So, um, Rindal stitch is part of the Finnish stitch family. Uh, 1 plus 2 F1 uh, bleeded edge. So, Korean, which is uh, more uh, known of these two stitches, so Korean is uh, 1 plus 2 F1. And uh, again, it goes under your thumb loop and it goes under your work yarn. Whereas in Rindal, it goes under your thumb loop and it goes over your work yarn. And uh, I really, really love the fabric that it's creating. Uh, I think this is possibly two or three rounds short from a heel. This one, which I'm currently working, so it requires a bit more just to get the same length. And then a few more rounds to make the to the heel. This I will be making a regular regular heel without um, not the class Brita heel, which I will be talking uh, in shortly. The needle is an uh, acrylic one. It's bought from Zojuana uh, uh, Runa. She's a Norwegian uh, mold binder slash uh, nail technician. So she uses the same acrylic she used to make nails, she makes needles. Uh, this yarn is over here, so it's uh, Borgo de Basi Luna. And this one is 50% uh, wool, 40% uh, acrylics and 10% alpaca. Uh, this is really easily felting yarn. I have no idea how they have actually managed to make this felting yarn with so much acrylic on it. But it does felt really, really well. Um, so uh, this is uh, 80 meters by 50 grams. Uh, this is what I have left of the first ball. And this is my second ball and then I have one additional different color. I will be making the heels with this color. Uh, the purple is colorway 57 and the pink is colorway 67. And I'm not exactly sure to whom these socks are. So, uh, yeah. But I really enjoy making them. Um, then I have another. Apparently I have moved into whips now. I actually have one more faux, but I will be talking about the FO with the uh, spinning section then. The second whip that I've been working on lately is the uh, also not by not the tucks. Uh, the issue is that I'm using the same needle that I'm using here with these, so I can't actually work these at the same time. Um, of course I could, but you know. I still have just one set of hands, so... These are approximately size 45. These are going to a friend of a friend. And here I'm using the Sakkala stitch, which is uh, part of the Russian stitch family. Uh, and it's 2 plus 2 plus 1. Which means that you have two stitches on your loop, you pick up two stitches behind, and then you pick up the third stitch behind where you twist it. So um, that's where it comes from. And here I'm using F2 connection, which means that I'm taking two, two uh, stitches from the previous round. And here I am uh, currently decreasing here. So this is the class Brita heel, which is a Swedish uh, variation of how to make a heel for uh, no socks. So once you have done 
approximately one third of the feet, then you make a long, long tongue, and then you start going around and increasing here at the heel, and then decreasing here at the uh, where the heel where the heel started or the uh, there. So uh, yeah. I'm using four different yarns here. I have the uh, mini rakki from uh, Yarnbo, which is a colorway six eight three one one. Then I have some uh, yarn snake, and this is the colorway seven seven one five. And more yarn. This is a uh, camouflage, and this is a colorway seven seven one six. Quite surprising. Um, so they are yarn uh, four ply soft yarn, four ply soft yarn line. And then I have Farball drops Farball uh, long print from Garn Studio. And this colorway 919. I have one ball of each. Uh, and I will work the socks as long as I have yarn left. Um, as you can see, I've done sort of like uh, every time I, uh, I'm done with the uh, yarn length I have, I have chosen a different yarn then. And uh, there was a teeny tiny issue. Uh, I, I I had decided that I have long print, then I have the camouflage, then I have the snake, and then I have the mini rocket. And when I was at the summer cottage, I think it was third weekend of May. So it was the weekend after Mother's Day. It was really dark, and I chose the uh, wrong color here. So there is a snake here and camouflage there. So. Um, yeah, but yeah, I don't care. And if there is a pen to care, so it's their problem, not mine. But yeah, they are getting there. They look huge. But of course, because uh, all point socks have very little stretch this way, they do stretch this way quite quite a lot. But this way, they don't really stretch at all. So they have to be really loose, so that they actually fit to the foot. Um, now I'm wondering if I have been working on any other flips that you know of. That you know of. Um, because, I mean, I have started, it's not just these socks and the hat that I have started. Um, I have started other lips as well. Um, these projects are currently living in my collection Ellen project bag. This is really fab big project bag, so uh, thank you Ellen for making it. Um, then another whip I'm uh, currently working on is where is there? It's a pair of socks. Uh, these are also going to be gifted. Um, so I have one sock done and the second sock I'm ready to uh, start the heel. These are Novita Seitzman Veljesta. Um, I bought these particularly for this project. Um, I'm not even actually sure if I have a single unicolor Novita Seitzman Veljesta at all. I have the grey which is a colorway 47. And then I have the uh, lilac, hot pink, whatever, um, which is uh, colorway 563. Uh, unfortunately, Novita had decided, uh, I think about a year ago, that they downsized their uh, ball size. They used to have 150 gram skins or balls, now they are 100 gram balls. So basically, you would have to buy two skins to make a pair of socks. 
uh, for adult and um, and um, there are of course well I mean I would have probably before just bought two skins because I'm making two pairs of socks uh, and make unicolor socks with something on them but now because I would have then needed to buy actually four skins of yarn because I would have needed two balls of each color so now I'm actually hoping that I will get re uh, I will finish these with three skins which is the same worth of yarn as it would have been earlier uh, by having this grey yarn that I'm using to both both pairs as a contrasting color um, like like this here uh, yeah these I have started and uh, well the second sock is here going on uh, these are living in the uh, project bag I got from uh, Skiffy Karpi uh, last year when I moved moved to Yon. So this is uh, the smaller of two bags that she made for me. The bigger one is actually housing my uh, Nano. Um, these are the projects I've been working on mainly uh, the past three months. Um, I'm thinking if I have done something else. I did do a few runs for my, a few lines for my uh, latch hook rug, but not that much that it would make any difference to show it to you. Um, what else? The drum corridor is at the cottage. I made, uh, or I'm making currently, an all binding needle for myself of uh, heat treated uh, birch wood, which is done except I need to make the eye for it so that I can actually get some yarn in. And I'm really looking forward to trying it <laughs> uh, because you know it's a real circle to make your own needles. And then they're spinning. Uh, so as you know, to the fleece started last Saturday. I have participated to it. I am participating to it. And uh, aside of that, I have emptied all my spindles. I currently do not have any yarn on the spindle. Um, this was um, a rollag I made few years back to test my blending board. It's bottom ups waste from World of Wool. Um, it has mostly merino, some silkish fiber, possibly bamboo or silk, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, nor do I care. <laughs> and this was spun with my um, supported spindle. And uh, I have been told that it's a Tibetan family of uh, supported spindles so uh, I bought it from the well of wool last year and this was the first time I was spinning with it a test was also started sometime last year and now it is done I did uh, make or I did try to make a plying bracelet to uh, ply this uh, it has been too plied well, my playing bracelet had a teeny tiny issue that it was not a bracelet. <laughs> there is a photo of it on my Instagram account if you want to see how it did it look. Um, the good thing is it had so much of a twist that it actually kept on its place. Um, it probably would have gone a bit faster if it would have been a bracelet. But all in all the playing took like two hours maybe. So uh, not that bad. Um, then I did finish two singles, one of which I started two weeks ago on Saturday. It's the lighter green uh, single on this particular yarn. I had um, two weeks ago a friend over and she mentioned that spinning looks something that might be really nice. 
and well, before she knew she had a spindle in her hand and she was sh learning to spin. <laughs> um, and I took my favorite spindle and I did spin some some with her as well. Um, this is um, or the lighter lighter color here is the belt of wool. Um, it's more of those merino mixed bags, you know, where you get. 25 grams of various colors in merino and the darker darker single is from Ike it's the last of the sample bag I bought from her 2017 from the um, US Garnet Festival I did actually collect the others as well here uh, except one but sort of like just show you this is the red one Spun with my super heavy spindle, and this is this was the first time I tried the uh, play, applying bracelet, I think. Uh, these are just single plies. Um, this is one with the uh, shots, uh, beginner friendly uh, spindle. I still hate spinning with it, and this is. Uh, spun with my own, own handmade uh, spindle last year and the blue one I have here is uh, also from this set it has silk on it um, the grey fiber is unknown but it loves waste and this is so that I have spun the um, the blue one has been spun on the spindle and the grey one has been spun on a spinning wheel and then I have plied it together with the spinning wheel uh, or on the spinning wheel so that I have actually uh, chain plied the blue yarn at the same time as I have then plied it together with the grey yarn so technically this is a four ply yarn and I did try the chain plying with the spin uh, with the spindle with the leftover green, dark green and I mean it worked well, it worked. It took ages and, you know, it was really difficult. <laughs> but of course, it's a learning curve there as well. Uh, I've also spun during this, uh, well, um, this uh, Tour de Fleece. This is a Godland sheep, a Godland fur sheep. Single ply, somewhat loosely spun uh, yarn. I think this is Aran, Aran weight-ish. 100 grams of it, um, hand dyed. I dyed this uh, during the uh, winter with the snow dyes. I was talking about this fiber, if not the previous episode, then the one before that. And then there is the mystery fiber. Um, it's not sort of like I know where I've got this, I just can't remember what it is. And uh, this is something sort of like I'm not and I do not understand how this turned out to be this. Um, so this is uh, chain plied yarn, and this had some over twist as a single, and then I plied it with the same whirl, and now it has over twist to the other direction, and the original over twist of the single still remains. So uh, we'll see how it will turn out. The uh, twist has been set with the weight. Uh, we'll see how it behaves then on the finished object. There is also uh, about also about 100 grams of this, the same way as the Kodish, uh Scotland uh, sheep. So this was day one. This was day two and three. On day four, now let's get this up from the wheel. Day four is this one. This is a fin sheep, Finnish Angora rabbit. Uh, this was also dyed uh, last winter. It looks like this as a drawing. Um, I really love spinning this fiber, and I really, really, really hope that the um, what's in there? 
uh, that the chain plotting that I'm planning to do with this will work well. I've done something really odd with this yarn. There's the one single that comes from up here and it goes as a throughout the whole bobbin here. I don't know why I've done that. Um, then I've been spinning something really uh, different. Um, this is button up spiced again from World of Wool. Currently I have two skeins of them or two hunks of it. Um, this has Selena, possibly Merino, maybe something else as well. It has a really, really strong sheep smell on it, which is really surprising because usually Merino does not have. So that's why I'm not exactly sure it is Merino, but it has a lot of Stellina on it. And there is a lot of Stellina everywhere here at the moment because of this thing. So this is a day staff. Um, made for hands as a spindle spinning. Uh, there is a, usually when we talk about these staffs, the distaff is on the spinning wheel. Uh, on medieval spinning tradition, uh, you would need this staff, which also would have been named the third hand. So you basically put it under your arm and then you start spinning. Um, this is a, uh, my handmade this stuff. I used some old kitchen towel. My great grandma's uh, kitchen towels are starting to be really, really poor condition, and I've been trying to rescue the ones that have her initials on them. I don't know if it has been her who has done the sewing or the embroidery, or her mother, or her sister, or have they bought them somewhere. But if it has her initials, I try to make something out of it so that the initials are still showing. And other than that, I just peeled, peeled this stick and then I have uh, whittled a bit so that it's quite even. And then I sanded it down. I watered it and I sanded it again. I haven't quite decided yet if I should actually put some oil or something else to it. Simply because... Uh, in my last longer but yeah so I have about one spin spindles worth yet to go there and then I have some more of this fiber to go so this is my 17 uh, 16th finished object this year and this is my six seventeenth 17th finished object this year so currently I'm on 17 FOs these, uh, the, the, what is it now called? The null bending needle I have at the cottage will be the 18th, I assume, because I don't think I will be finishing anything I have at home before I go there. The socks possibly, or the, the needed socks possibly, but then we'll see. But yeah, mm, this is really sort of like. I have spun sometime, uh, I've spun a few times with this uh, medieval inspired uh, spindle. This is really small spindle as you can see. The whirl weights <sighs> almost nothing. And um, I have tried to spin with it a few times and it just has not worked. It's really really awful to spin with it because I mean I'm not quick enough in drafting to actually make it spin spin fast enough. But with, with this thingy, it actually works really, really nice because you can just use the one hand all the time to focus on uh, twirling the, uh, the uh, spindle. And another hand is just controlling the wool that comes from uh, this stuff. And the wool is just there. You don't need to be worried that it will be in your uh, thread and it will be inside of the, uh, the twist as it happens really easily when you have a lot of twist in a uh, long, uh, long spinning fiber. So uh, 
it's just a really 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 easy technique this one to use and I really like it um, I was actually on my first spinning class on uh, Wednesday yeah Wednesday evening so uh, which happened at home over zoom so no quarantine breaks there or no quarantine breaks there and um, So I've spun two hunks since uh, this spindle does not have great intake. I think it's somewhere between 15 and 20 grams. I have some ideas what to do with this yarn once I get a sort of like a bit more of it. Uh, but I'm not going to be talking about that just yet because you know um, I have 30 works in progress at the moment. Um, which you can also see here. So you might understand why I'm not actually running to start a new project um, just now. Because, you know, it's uh, the new academic year is starting in about two months time. Um, and I assume they will have plenty of things planned for us. So I would prefer then to have actually some crafting time for those projects as well, not just for my own. Although I do find my own much more satisfying because I get to do what I want, not what I'm told to. <laughs> this is how it works. And then you just draw it. And uh, apparently when you get the hang of it, you can actually draw and twirl at the same time. Currently I need to do one or the other. So, um, yeah, it's really, really made a difference with this spindle and how to spin with it. So, uh, it was really, really nice class. It was taught by uh, Katrin Kania. Uh, she's a German textile archaeologist. Uh, her main book will be published in English sometime, sometime here. I'm not sure actually when. Um, but the translation work from German to English has already started, which is really great because uh, there's. Uh, there's a certain problems when trying to read German textile archaeology books because uh, the vocabulary is really niche. So it's not enough that you can actually do it in German, you also have to know all the, of the voc vocabulary. And uh, in English, oh, okay, I admit, in English it's also a niche. But, uh, not as bad as in German. Actually, I think one of the big things is that I can actually hear the English niche vocabulary spoken here and there, but the German ones I can't, so that's why it's much more difficult to learn. Although I do have some uh, textile archaeology books and textile books in general about the construction of the textiles, uh, both in German and in English, and in French, and in Dutch, and in Japanese. Well, the Japanese book is about null binding, strictly null binding. So, uh, that's much more sort of like easier to just look at the pictures. <laughs> but yeah, this works that way. Uh, I've done some dyeing as well. I have a feeling these won't be showing up the gorgeous color they are. Uh, this is Let Lobby, 500 grams of it, 250 bar skin. And these have been dyed with Lupin flowers. Um, I was late with this project. Um, it has been so hot. A uh, Lupin flower, usually Lupin flowers or blooms here from midsummer till mid-July. 
and uh, I did this dyeing last Saturday, which was Midsummer Saturday, and uh, I barely, barely got 10 liters of flowers. I would have needed at least 20 liters, probably 25, maybe even 30 liters to get like this really, really gorgeous, dark, deep shade. Um, but I got 10 liters of flowers, I need to dye at least both of these hunks, possibly even something else as well. And I just thought, yeah, let's go with it. If it doesn't turn out to be have a color, I can always over dye them. So I modeled it them with Alan, and um, then I did put in some water and about half of the flowers. Then I did insert both of the yarns there, and then I did put some more water and the rest of the flowers. I pushed them all down, put the uh, top on, and uh, on the event. The uh, green color that I have here. So it's because the the chemical that is on the Lupin flowers, which would um, I can't I have no idea what the word is in English, but the type of chemical that is inside of the uh, color is really temperature fragile. So basically, if you go over fifty five degrees Celsius. The blue color or the blue dye you would get out of it breaks down, and you're left with the green color. And um, I had a lot of problems of getting my fireplace going. It wasn't just starting. It wasn't just burning. It was just mainly mainly smoking. And when I finally just got it going and they started to burn nicely, I, just, I don't care what comes out of it. <laughs> so now they are green, and it's really sort of like. Variegated green because, of course, I have a 10 liter pot where I dye both of these, and basically, that's 250 grams too much of yarn in the pot at the same time. So, um, they have been, of course, what's squished, uh, squished there, so they are variegated. I will be, uh, when I start knitting with them, I will be knitting from both skeins at the same time, um, to even out the color a bit. This will become a sweater. I have an additional half a kilo of Let's Lobby, which I will dye in different colors. So far, I'm planning on red onion, yellow onion, and cochineal, possibly something else. I think I have six contrasting colors. There are 10 skins of the bag. I have one that has. Three, two that has two, that's seven. Uh, and then I have four. So I, I have actually six, no, seven contrasting colors to go with them. And uh, yeah, we'll see how it turns out. But this is, uh, as I said, it's a uh, lead lobby. So it's from Istex, it's Icelandic wool. Um, it's really hard to come by. <laughs> uh, I found, uh, I actually there would have been more, but I bought just the one kilo of the, the white, and then I had previously bought one or two single balls of yarn of the left lobby for dyeing purposes. So I, I think I have all in all 21 balls or 22 balls, of which I have 10 here. So, um, they will become a sweater, Icelandic style sweater, yoke sweater, however you want to call it. And uh, I'm really looking forward to it, actually. <laughs> Once I finish one or two of my currently on progress sweaters, I have one, two, three, four, five. At least five sweaters on the go at the moment. So I'm not actually rushing to get the sixth one on the go as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a feeling that's it. I might have forgotten something. 
I may not have. Uh, yeah. The next episode will be out sometime in late August, early September. Um, I'm trying to get back to every three weeks sort of a timetable come uh, fall. Because the one month is quite a long time in the end. And even if it's just less to show you every three weeks, um, I think that will be much more better option for myself. And it will also keep the episode length a bit more understandable. I have a feeling this episode is almost over and a half long. And I haven't even actually talked about the books. I haven't shown any books. Um, there's a good pile of books to show you. Um, so I will try to go back to every three weeks. We have the read, reading with box Mal 21, which ended at the end of May. I did finish eight projects for it, which was less than I had hoped. Let's put it this way. You can also think if I have done 17, I have finished 17 projects this year and eight of them have been casted on prior to this year, so it's not really a good percentage either. But that's life. And I hope to do some more uh, finishing of the old projects uh, in the upcoming months and weeks. I've been uh, eyeing my charging project. Um, I've been trying to learn the tatting of the shuttle because I already I only learned the needle version and I really want to learn the shuttle version as well and um, so that has been on my list and of course when I finish the socks and the other socks and the third pair of socks and the fourth pair that I have to do to match the first pair um, so We'll see what I continue after that. Um, I really want to learn one of those uh, turning stitches in all binding. They are really, really, really weird stitches. And they are really weird stitch family. <laughs> so um, that's on my to-do list. I don't know yet what to do with that. Uh, there's also the option that I might do a pair of wrist warmers with this. For example, with some sort of turning stitch. Or with the Dalana or uh, one of the family less stitches. And um, yeah, a lot of crafting happening, or well, a lot of planning of crafting is happening, less crafting is happening. <laughs> uh, I have a feeling I haven't actually done a thing. Um, well, I have actually started a garden at my summer, co at the summer cottage. There's a lot of sort of like daily daily tasks take a huge amount of time there because everything has to be done the old-fashioned way. Uh, so uh, it's just regular life that takes a lot of time. And uh, learning a new um, patient da patient data system is also really ex <laughs> really exhausting. It does not work the way I think it should be working when it's the how, how the logical thing would be to work it, but um, the work itself is really interesting and uh, it the, it it does have some new things, of course because the patients are so different to my previous experience. Uh, but in general, it's it's not that much of a learning curve. It's mostly with the computer where the learning curve is happening, if it's happening. And uh, hopefully, hopefully I'll get back to work on the beginning of next week. And I won't have to be quarantined again. Ever. <laughs> it's really boring. Really boring. And, uh, yeah. I think this is about it. Um, I'll see you in the uh, end of end of August ish, beginning of September or so. We'll see. 
and uh, happy knitting everyone, stay safe, wash your hands, wear your masks, get your vaccinations when you can, and uh, see ya, bye.